Chapter three. I don't sleep more than a couple of hours that night. When I do, I dream of Shiloh. When I don't, I'm thinking about him. Out in the rain all out in the rain all afternoon. Head on his paws, watching our door, thinking how I, thinking how how I disappointed him.、Uh, whistling like I meant something that first time. Getting him to. Come to me, then taking him on back to the travelers to be kicked all over again. By five o'clock, when it's growing light, I know pretty much, pretty much what I have to do. I have to buy that dog from Jot Travers. I don't let my mind go any further. Don't dwell on what Jot would want for Shiloh,、um, or even whether he would sell. Especially,、uh, especially, don't ask myself how I'm supposed to get the money. All I know is that I can think of only one way to get the dog, get that dog, away from Judd, and that's what I'm gonna have to do. My bed is the couch in the living room, so when Dad comes in. Comes in to fix his breakfast. I pull on my jeans and go out to sit. Go out to sit across from him, in the kitchen. First, he makes himself a lunch to carry to work. He drives his jeep to the post office. He drives his jeep to the post office in his sister's wheel, where he cases mail for around two hundred families and delivers it. Then comes back to the friendly post office where he cases mail for two hundred more.、Uh, delivers that too.、Uh, route takes him about eighty-five miles. On roads, you can hardly get by one in winter. Morning, he says to me as he stops. A sandwich in a sack, then starts in starts in on his breakfast, which is wheat chunks and any fruit he can get from our peach tree. He makes himself coffee and eats the corn bread or biscuits Ma saves for him from our meal the night before. Can you think of a way I could earn myself some money? I ask him with this froggy kind of voice that shows you aren't woke up yet. <laughs> Dad takes another bite of cornbread, looks at me for a moment, then goes on studying his cereal. Says exactly what I figure.、Uh, he's he'll say collect some bottles. Says exactly what I figure. He'll say collect some bottles. Take them. In for deposit. Pick up some aluminum cans, maybe for the recycling place. I mean, real money. I mean, real money. Got to have it faster than that. How fast? I try to think. Wish I could earn it in a week, but I. But no, I can't. Have to go out every day for a whole summer collecting cans and bottles to have much of anything at all. Have to go out every day for a whole summer collecting cans and bottles to have much, to have much of anything at all. A month maybe, I tell him. I'll ask along my mail route, but don't know many folks, many folks with money to spare. He says, which is what I thought. I'll ask along my mail route, but don't know many folks with money to spare. After Dad's gone off, Becky gets up before Ma, and I fix her a bowl of Cheerios. But her sneakers on, but put her sneakers on so he won't stub her toes and brush the snarls from her hair. Red. Once in a book about how some kids earned money babysitting, boy, if I ever get paid even a nickel for every time I've taken care of Becky, Dora Lynn too, I would have to a lot of dollars. I would have a lot of dollars. I do a whole bunch of jobs that other kids, other places, 
I do a whole. I do a I do a whole bunch of jobs that other kids, other places get paid to do,、uh, but it wouldn't even it wouldn't ever occur to me to ask for pay. If I asked that, he would say, "You live in this house, boy." And when I said when I would say yes, he would say, "Then you do your share like the rest of us." You do your share like the rest of us, which is why I never asked. You do your share, like the rest of us. More Cheerios, says Becky, and all the while I'm making her breakfast. I'm thinking the best route 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 to take to find aluminum cans by the time Darlene gets up. Wearing one of Dad's old T-shirts for her nightgown, I'd figure how I could double my can count. But when Ma gets up a few minutes later, she takes one look at me and guesses what I'm thinking. "You got that dog on your mind," she says, lifting the big iron skillet to the stove top and laying some bacon in it. Thinking don't cost nothing, I tell her. She just gives me a little smile, then, then, and sets about making my bacon crisp, the the way I like it. And we don't say any more about Judd's dog. Must walk five miles that morning, and all I find is seven cans and one bottle. When Dad comes home at about four, he hasn't found anybody looking for help either. But he says. Uh, the Sears Sears fall catalog. Come in this afternoon, Marty. You got nothing better to do tomorrow.、Uh, you could ride my route with me, help deliver them. I say yes to that. No, I won't get nothing more out of it, out of it than a soft drink.、Um, no, no, I won't get nothing more out of it. Than a soft drink at the gas station, but I like going around in the jeep, riding over back roads like Ripon Truck and Cowhouse Run Road with Dad. Can't take a bag with me just in case. Can't take a bag with me just in case. Pick up any cans or bottles I happen to see. That night, Dad and I sit out on the porch. Mas. In the swing behind us, shelling lima beans for next day, and Becky and Dara lins in the grass, catching lightning bugs and putting them in in a jar. That laughs at the way Becky squeals when she gets a bug in her hand. But seeing those bugs in a jar reminds me of Shiloh all chained up at Judd's, a prisoner as sure as those bugs. Truth is, about everything reminds me of Shiloh. You once get a dog to look at you, the way Shiloh looked at me. You don't forget it. Got seventeen. Dara Lee shouts, "Aren't they pretty, Ma?" Almost couldn't turn off the electricity and let 'em light the kitchen. Ma says, "You're going to let 'em go?" I ask. Dara Lee shrugs. They'll die if you keep them in a jar. I tell her. Becky, she comes over and crawls onto my lap. We'll let them go, Marty, she says, and kisses me on the neck. A butterfly kiss, she calls it. Bets her eyelashes against my skin.、Uh, feels like a moth wings. She laughs and I, I laugh. Then far off I hear a dog. Last wa, leastwise I think it's a dog. Leastwise. Might could be a fox cup, fox cup, but I think Shiloh. You hear that? I asked that.、Um, I asked that. Just a hound complaining is all he says. Next morning, Dad gives me a nudge when he comes through the kitchen, and I'm up. Am I? And I'm up like a shot. We ride the Sisterville and ride to Sisterville, and I haul all those catalogs out to the jeep. While that case is male, not everybody gets a catalog, of, of course. But anyone who places on places on order with 
third string the ear gets one. So there's lots of, lots to load up. By quarter by quarter of nine, we're on the route that pulls the jeep up close to the mailboxes, and I stuff the mail in, turn up the little red flag on the side, if there is one. Some folks even wait down at the box, and then you feel real bad if you don't have anything for them. Dad knows everybody's name, though, and he always takes time to say a little something. Morning, Bill, he says to an old man whose face lights up like Christmas when we stop. How's the wife doing? About the same, the man says. But this catalog sure gonna cheer up. And he sets up for his house. Mail tucked under his arm. People even leave something in their boxes once in a while for that. Mrs. Ellison always leaves a little loaf of banana bread or a cinnamon, cinnamon roll. And that saves it to eat with his lunch. After we finish Sister's Wheel, we do the friendly route. But as the jeep gets up near Shiloh, my heart starts to pound. I'm thinking of closing my eyes tight in case the dog's around. If I see his eyes looking at me, they'll just drive me crazy. I can hear dogs barking when we're half a mile off from Judd Travel's Trevor's trailer. Dogs can pick up the sound of a jeep that quick. I get Judd's mail ready for him. He hasn't got any catalog coming, but he's got two other magazines that'll probably warm his heart. Guns and ammo and shooting times. Why don't he take a magazine about dogs? I'm thinking, teach him, about, teach him how to be kind. All dog is changed when we get to his place, so none's waiting for us at the box. But Jod is. He's got... A big old sickle is cutting weeds along his side of the road. Morning, that says as the jeep pulls up. Joe straightens his back. His shirt all soaked with sweat. And he wears this brown hand handkerchief tied around his forehead to keep the sweat from running in his eyes. How are you doing, Ray? He says. And comes over to the jeep with his hand out. I gave him his mail, and he even stinks like sweat. I know everybody sweats, sweats, and everybody sweats, sweats, everybody that everybody sweat thinks stinks, but seems to me just sweat thing stinks worse than anyone's mean sweat. How come you aren't at work? Dad says. You think these are not work? Judd answers. Then laughs. Got me a week of vacation coming, so I take a day, take a day now and then. This Friday, I'm going hunting again. Take the dogs up on the ridge and see if I can get, I can get me some rabbit, possum maybe. Haven't had me a possum dinner for some time. Haven't had me a possum dinner for some time. Dogs okay? Dad asks, and I know he is asking for me. Lean and mean, says Judd. Keep them half starved. They're, they'll hunt better. Got to keep them healthy, though, or you won't have them long, Dad says. I know he's saying that for me, too. Lose one. I'll buy, I'll buy another, Judd tells him. I can't help myself. I lean out the window where I can see his face real good. Big round face, whiskers on his cheeks. And chin where he hasn't shaved his face for five days. Tight little eyes looking down on me beneath his bussy brows. That dog that followed me home the other day. He okay? He's learning, just says. Didn't give him didn't give him a ounce of supper that night. Just put him where he could watch the others eat. Teach him not to wander off. Got him back in the shed right now. Got him back in the shed. My stomach hurts for Shiloh, that dog. I say again, what's his name? Judd just laughs. 
and his teeth dark, where the tobacco juice oozes through. Hasn't got a name. Never name any of my dog. Dogs. Dogs one, two, three, four is all. When I want them, I whistle. When I don't, I give them a kick. Get scram out, and damn it, that's my dog's names. And he laughs, making the fat on his belly shake. I'm so mad, I can see. I can't see. I'm so mad, I can't see. I know I should shut my mouth, but it goes on talking. His name's Shiloh. I say. Judd looks down at me and spits sideways. Studies me a long. Studies me a, a good long time. Then shrugs as the jeep moves forward again. On along the river, shrugs as the jeep moves forward again and along and al- along the river. Chapter four, Marty. That says when we are around the bend. Sometimes you haven't got the sense to shut up. You can't. You can't go telling a man what to call his dog. But I'm mad too. Better than calling him git or scram. Judd Travel Travers has the right to name his dog, anything he likes or nothing at all, and you've got to get it through your head that it's his dog, not yours, and put your mind to other things. The jeep bounces along for a good time, not yours, and put your mind to other things. The jeep bounces along for a good long mile before I speak again. I can't, Dad. I say finally, and this is his. This is time. His voice is gentle. Well, son, you gotta try. I eat my peanut butter and soda soda cracker sandwiches with Dad at noon, plus the zucchini bread. Mrs. Ellison had left in her mailbox mailbox for him, and. And after all the Sears catalogs and mail is delivered, we have. I eat my peanut butter and soda cracker sandwiches with Dad at noon, plus the zucchini bread Mrs. Ellison had left in her mailbox mailbox for him. And after all the Sears catalogs and mail is delivered, we head back to the sisters Sistersville. Post office. I get my Coca Cola at the gas station while Dad finishes up, and we start home. I forget all about looking for cans and bottles. The can I'm holding is the only one I got. Judge Travers goes hunting near every weekend, don't he? Doesn't he? I ask Dad. I suppose he does. You can shoot at just. You can shoot at just. You can shoot at just about anything that moves. Of course not. You can only shoot at what's in season. I'm thinking how about a year ago I was fooling around up on the ridge and come across a dead dog, a dead beagle, with a hole in its head. Never said anything because what was there to say? Because what was there to say? Somebody out hunting got a dog by mistake. I figured it happens, but the more I think on it now, I wonder if it was Judd Travers shooting a dog on purpose. I wonder if it wasn't just Travers shooting a dog on purpose, shooting shooting one of his own dogs that didn't please him. Shooting one of his dogs didn't that shooting one of his dog shooting one of his own dogs that didn't please him. I wonder if it wasn't just travels shooting on, shooting a dog on purpose. They're still talking. We've got a new game warden in the country, and I hear he's plenty tough. Used to be a man, used to be a man could kill a deer on his own property any time if the if that deer was eating his garden. Warden would look. The other way, but they tell me the new warden will find you good. Well, 
That's the way it ought to be, I guess. What if a man shoots a dog? I ask. That looks over at me. Dogs aren't ever in season, Marty. Now you know that. But what if a man shoots on one? What if a sh- What if a man shoots one anyway? That would be up to the sheriff to decide what to do. I guess. The next day, I start early, and set out on the main road to friendly with a plastic bag. Get me eleven aluminum. Get me el. Get me eleven aluminum cans. But that's all. Could walk my legs off for a year and not even have enough. To buy half a dog, could walk my legs off for a year. The question I tried, the questions I try not to think about before I came, before come back to me now. Would Joe Travers want want to sell Shallow at all? And how much would he want for him if he did? And Even if I got shallow for my very own, how was I supposed to feed him? There aren't many leftover scraps of anything in our house. Every extra bite of pork chop or boiled potato or spoonful of peas gets made into soup. If we had enough money for me to have a dog and buy its food and pay the vet and everything, I would have had. One by now, Darlene's been begging for a cat for over a year. It isn't that we're we're rock pool. Trouble is that Grandma Preston's got real feeble, and she's been cared for by that sister over in in Clausburg. Have to have nurses any time, Aunt. Hetty goes out, and every spare cent we got goes to pay for Grandma's care. Nothing left over to feed a dog, but I figure to get to I figure to get to the pra- get to that problem later on. But I figure to get to that problem later on. I wonder if maybe in time, if I never see Shiloh again. I'll forget about him, but then I'm lying on the couch that night after everyone else has gone to bed. I wonder if maybe in time, if I never see Shiloh again, I'll forget about him. But then I'm lying on the couch that night after everyone else everyone else has gone to bed, and I hear this far off sound again, like a dog crying, not barking. Not howling, not whining, even crying, and I get this awful ache in my chest. I wonder if it is a dog, if it is Shiloh. I know you want a dog, Marty. Ma says to me on Thursday. She's sitting at the kitchen table with cardboard boxes all around her, folding a stack of letters and putting them in envelopes. Ma gets work. To do, get, Ma gets work work to do here at home any time she can. I wish we had the money so everyone, every one of you kids could have a pet. But with Grandma seeming to need more care, we just don't. That's that. I nod. Ma knows me better than I know myself sometimes, but she doesn't have this straight. I don't want just say. I don't want just any dog. I want Shiloh because he needs me, needs me bad. It's Friday morning when I hear the sound. That's our phone's mail route. Darlene and Becky is watching cartoons on TV. Us out on the back porch washing clothes in the old washing machine that don't that doesn't work. Washing clothes in the old washing machine. Only the ringer part works if you turn it by hand. I'm sitting at the table eating a piece of bread spread with lard and jam when I hear the noise. I know it. I know it's Shiloh. Only the softest kind of noise and right close. I fold the bread up, jelly, 
to the inside, stick it in my pocket, and go out for go out go out the front door. Shiloh's under the seat. Camor had on his paws, just like the day we, just like the day he followed me home in the rain. Soon as soon as I see him, I know two things: Judge Travers has taken his dogs out hunting, like he said, and Shallows run away from the pack. And I'm not going to take him back, not now, not ever. I don't have him to think. I don't have time to think how I had promised Judd if I ever saw Shiloh lose again. I don't have time to think how I had promised Judd if I ever saw Shiloh lose again. I'd bring him back. Don't even think what I'm gonna tell Dad. All I know right then is that I have to get Shiloh away from the house, where none of the family will see see him. I run barefoot down the front steps. And over to where Shiloh's lying, his tail just thumping like crazy in the grass. Shiloh, I whisper, and gather him up in my arms. His body is shaking all over, but he doesn't try to get away. Doesn't creep off from my from me the way he did the fir- that first day. I hold him as close and careful as I carry Becky when she's asleep. And I start off up the, up the fall far hill into the woods, carrying my dog. I know that if it was if I was to see Judge Travers that very minute with his rifle, I would tell him he'd have to shoot me before I I would let, ever let him near Shiloh again. I know that if I was to see Judge Travers. That very minute, with his rifle, I would tell him that he'd have to shoot me before I ever let him near Shiloh again. There are birds and sneakers on the path up the hill, and usually I wouldn't take it without sneakers. I wouldn't take it without sneakers. But if there's birds and sneakers in my feet, I hardly feel them. I know Judd Travers and his hounds won't be over here, cause this hill belongs to my dad. Get me as far as the sad shad bush next to the pine, and then I sit down and hug Shiloh. First time I really have him to myself. First time I can hug him. Nobody looking, just squeeze his thin body, pat his head. Stroke his ears, hello. I tell him as though he knows it's his name. Judge Travers is never gonna kick you again. And the way his eyes look at me, then the way he reaches up and licks my face, it's like it seals the promise. I had made a promise. I had made a promise to Judge Travers. I wasn't gonna keep. You just help me. But I'm making one to Shallow that I will. God strike me dead. I had made a promise to Judge Travers I wasn't gonna keep him. She just helped me, but I'm making one to shallow that I will. I set him down at last and go over to the creek for a drink of water. Shallow follows along beside me. I cup my hands and drink, and Shallow helps himself. Lapping it up. Now what? I ask myself. The problem is looking me scare in the face. The problem is looking me scare in the face. I got to keep Shallow a secret. That much I know. But I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep him chained. But I'm not gonna keep him chained. Chained. Only thing I can think of is to make him a pen. Don't like the idea of it. But I will. I'll be with him as much as I can. Pen. Make him a pen. I take him back to the shed bush and Shiloh lays down. Shiloh, I say, patting his head, stay. He thumbs his tail. His tail. I start to walk away. Looking back, Shiloh gets up. Stay, I say again, louder. 
and point to the ground. He lays back down, but I know he is like to follow anyway. So I pull him over to a pine tree, take the belt of my jeans, loop it, loop it, loop it through the raggedy old collar, Shiloh's wearing, and fasten the belt on the tree. Shiloh doesn't like it much, but he's a, he's quiet. I go down the path. And every so often, I turn around. Shiloh is looking at me like he will never see me again. But he doesn't bark. Strangest thing I've ever seen, seen in a dog to be that still. Ma still on the back porch when she washes. It takes here. It takes her near all day. Darlene and Becky stuck to the TV, so I go to the shed. By the side of the house, and I take the extra fencing that used to, that used when he had when when we had a small chickens. I take me a piece of wire too, and go back up the hill. Shallow still there, and he doesn't try to get up while I set to work. I I string the fencing. I string the fencing around the trunk trunks of three three small trees, four corner posts, and then back to the pine tree again, where I fasten it with wire. Pen measures about six by eight feet. I go back down to the shed again, and this time I get the old rotten planks that took out of. The back steps when he put in the new pick me up. An old pine, old pine tin too. I take the planks up to Shiloh's pen and make him a lean to, at, lean to at one end to protect him from from rain. Fill the pine pine tin. With water, so he will have something to drink. Last of all, I take the lard bread from my pocket and feed it to Shallow in in little pieces, letting him lick my fingers every after every bite. I wrap my arms around him. I pat him, roll my hands over his ears, even kiss his nose. I tell him about a million times I love him so I love him as much as I love my ma. The worry part is whether or not he'll stay quiet. I'm hoping he will, 'cause he was silent dog to begin with. But all the way back down the hill to the house, I put my finger to my lips and turn back. Shh. Shiloh, he doesn't make a sound like he had the bark bit out of him when he was a pup. And it just never come back. I'm tense as a cricket that night. Tense when Dad drives up in his jeep, afraid the dog will bark. Tense when Darlene and Becky are out in yard playing after dinner, squealing and yelling, afraid that Shallow will want to get in, get in on the fun, and maybe dig a hole under the fence. He never comes. I managed to take a piece of potato and some cornbread up to him before it gets dark. I sit down in his pen with him, and he crawls all over me, licking my face. If I, if he had been a cat, he would have purred. He was that glad to see me. Tell him I'm coming back tomorrow with some kind of leash for him. Tell him we're gonna run over. Run all over that hill, him and me every day. Tell tell him he is my dog now, and I'm not ne I'm never going to let anybody hurt him again, ever. And then I leave wiring the fence good. I go home and sleep a full night, first time in a long while. I got to take. I got to take. I got to take one problem at a time. 
I tell myself, problem number one, where to keep Shiloh hide salt? Problem number two, would Shiloh be quiet? Yeah, he would. Problem number three, how am I going to get food out of the house enough to feed Shiloh twice a day without my noticing? The next morning before breakfast, as soon as, as soon as that's gone, I take a biscuit from the kitchen and a rope from the shed outside and run up run up the far hill before my and Darlene and Becky get out of bed. This time Shiloh's on his feet waiting for me, tail going like a windshield windshield whipper, fast beat, a soft eep of pure joy cuts off kick when I say shh but as soon as I'm in up the pan, Shiloh is leaping up almost shoulder high to lick my cheek, nuzzling my hands, my thighs. He gulps down the biscuit I give him. Once more, I can tell. But he don't. He doesn't bark. Seems to know he's safe only as long as he's quiet. I tie the loop to his collar. Shallow boy, we're gonna. We're. Going for a run, I tell him to get in and to get in out to get in and out of Shallow's pen. I go I got to unfasten the piece of wire that holds the fencing against the trunk of the pine, then move the fencing aside long enough to slip out. Shallow lets me go through first. He follows. And then we are both together like a six-legged animals, pounding along up the path, legs bumping, shallow lips leaping up to lick my hand. I let go of the rope and let shallow run free for a while. If he goes ahead even a few steps, he stops and looks back to see if I'm coming. If he stops to sniff at a tree or bush, and I go on by, his feet pound double time to catch up. Just out of the woods, on the other side of the hill, there's a meadow, and I slump down in the grass to rest. Shallows all over me, licking my face, sloppy wet. I giggle and roll over on my stomach, covering my head and neck with my arms. Shiloh whines and nudges his nose under my shoulder, working to roll me over. I laugh and turn on my back, pulling Shiloh down onto my chest, and for a while we both lay there, lay there panting, enjoying the, enjoying the sunshine, belonging to each other. What do you do today, Marty? Dad asks as he gets out of his jeep later that evening. Oh, looked for groundhogs up on the hill. Fold around, I'll, I tell him. How's the can collecting coming? Found some a couple, found some a couple couple days ago. Saw some bottles in the ditch down near Doc Murphy's. That says, I'll take a look. I'll, I tell him, and set out with my bag. I have to keep on collecting collecting cans enough to cover some money for meat and bones from the grocer down in Friendly. The bigger Shiloh grows, the more he will eat. <coughs> when I get back home, supper is on the table, and I slip into my chair just as Dad asks the blessing, dear Lord, dear Lord, Lord, we thank you for the food you've provided for. Our table, table, bless it to nourish the good within us. Amen. Ma picks up the meat loaf and passes it around, and the meal begins. I eat about half my supper, and then say, "I've been getting this sort of fulfilling at dinner, Ma." And then I'm hungry again before I go to bed. Ma, don't even look up. Well, don't. Well, don't eat so much at dinner then, and eat again before bedtime. I've been getting this sort of full feeling at dinner, Ma, and then I'm hungry again before I go to bed. Don't even look up. Well, don't eat so much at dinner then, and 
eat again before bedtime. Food will be all gone by then. There's always cornflakes or something, but I get hungry for meat and potatoes later. Save some back then. Darlene will eat it. For God's sake. Marty says, Ma, who was cold meat love? Darlene says. Forks continue clinking on the table. Becky keeps on digging her fork in her boiled potato. No one looks up. No one pauses. No one even questions. Easy as falling off a log. I get up from the table finally and put some of my meat. Love. I get up from the table finally and put some some of my meat. Love. And half a to- half a tomato, half a potato on a saucer. I'm putting this in the fridge, Darlene. I say, don't you go picking at it. I won't. I told you. She says. I go into the other room and sit down on the sofa. So far, so good. You seem restless, Marty. Ma calls. Ma had no. I got lots to do. Where David Howard this summer? Where's David Howard this summer? Haven't seen him around. Think he went to Tennessee to visit his uncle. Un- to visit his uncle, Fred Michael. Haven't seen Fred. Michael has gone to some kind of camp. You're not lonely. How can I be lonely with the whole outdoors to play in? I answer. Wish they would get off my back. You can ride along the work. You can ride along to work with me again anytime you want. I pick up the comic book I bought a few weeks back. I want to go. I'll let you know. I tell him. Gradually, the kitchen clatter dies down. Dad, bla- Dad belches, belches, and goes out on the back porch to look at the sky. Same, a- same as he always does. Becky is fooling with her food, and Ma sends her away from the table. Darlene giggles at Becky, and gets asked to clear the dishes. I wait until everyone is out of the kitchen and s- sitting around on the back porch to catch the breeze. As usual, Becky and Darlene hoop and tumble around in grass in the grass, glad for an audience. Uh, and after I sit at after I sit a respectable amount of time, I say, I "Think, I'll take my twenty-two and go out far." Hill a while, go up the far hill a while. What you figure on shooting this time of evening? Dad asks. Just working on my aim. I tell him. See how good I can hit when the lights dim. Don't you ever, never, aim your gun toward this house or yard. Ma says. I'll point it that way. I promise. I go back inside for my gun. Slip the leftover food. From the saucer into a little plastic sack, and set off the hill. Set off, set off up the hill. The sounds of my sister shouts and giggles behind me. Again, as I get near the pen, I hear soft, happy yips. But soon as I say shh, the noise stops. The only sound you can hear is the swishing of Shiloh's tail. Hitting the fence and the soft pad of his paws as he leaps up in the air in sheer, pure happiness. The sloppy slap of his jo- jaws together as he gobbles down the supper I've brought him, and then he commenced commenced to sober, slobber love all over me as well. I unhook the wire, push the fence open, and lead the shallow to the stream for a drink, filling the pie pan with with fresh water. When I lead him back to the pen again, I can tell he's disappointed. Wanted to go for a run. 
but I gave him enough hugging and squeezing and petting to last the night, with the promise of another run through the meadow the next day. I am halfway down the hill when I remember I haven't fired my gun once, and wonder if Dad will say anything. By by the time I reach the back porch, though, the whole family is facing down the driveway, cause there's the sound of the sound of a truck motor growing louder and louder. I stop in my tracks, fingers tightening around my gun. Dad, sitting on the edge of the porch, leans forward so he can see. Looks like Joe Trevor speak up. He says, "My chest feelings tight, like I'm having trouble breathing." The truck pulls up by the side of the house, and the door swings open. The truck pulls up. By the side of the house, and the door swings open. Evening, Dad calls out as Judd, wearing his old Western-style boots with the sharp heel, gets out and comes over. Evening, he says, "You had dinner?" My asks. I got some leftovers. I could heat up real quick. Had me some ribs already. He says, "Aren't looking for a meal?" Mrs. Preston. I'm looking for a dog. He sure doesn't waste any time getting to the point. Now my heart really pounding, hearts really pounding. The new dog of your, the new dog of yours, the new dog of yours run off again. Dad asks him. I swear to God, I find him this time. I'm going to break his legs. This is a spit. Oh come on, Jad, a dog with four broke legs. Are no good, no dog to you at all. He is no dog to me at all. The way he keeps running off, it's the fourth time he has left a pack. When I had him out hunting, I got to teach him a lesson. Whomp, whop him up, whop him good and starve him lean. Wondered if you'd seen him. I sure didn't see him on my road today. And you know, if I had, I would have put him in the jeep and brought him to you straight away. Brought him to you straight away. Says that. What about that boy of yours? Think you seen him? Dad had heard me coming back from the hill, and he turns around. Marty, I stand rooted to the ground at the side of the house. What? Come on around here. Just dogs missing again, and he wants to know. Have you seen him? His dog here in this yard. Haven't seen any of dog, any any dog of any kind in our yard all day. I say, coming a few steps closer. Judd is sure studying me hard. So is Dad. Well, how about when you went out looking for bottles? Dad asks. You see him. You see him then? No. My voice is stronger now. So that big German shepherd of bakers that gets loose sometimes, and so a little old gray dog, but sure didn't see the beagle. Well, you keep an eye on. You keep an eye out sharp, Judd says. And if you see him, you throw a rope around him, drag him over here. I only look at him, can't speak, can't even nod, can't even nod my head. I wouldn't, I wouldn't never promise him that. You hear what he asked you, Marty says that. I nod my head. Yes, I heard all right. Okay then, Judd says, and gets back in his pickup. Have any luck hunting yesterday? Dad calls after him. A rabbit, so a groundhog, but didn't get it. That the、uh, that new dog hadn't run off.、Uh, he would have got it for me. He wasn't such a good hunting dog. I would have shot him by now. Sherry Sh- Sh- would get on you if you do something like that, Judd. Lo never told me before. What I could do with my dogs won't won't be telling me now. Judd says he laughs, waves his hand, starts the engine, and the pickup pulls away. 
night in West Virginia. Chapter six. Night in West Virginia is as dark as black can be. No car lights sweeping across my walls or stealing like when I stay overnight with David Howard down in Friendly. No street lamps shining in the windows. No lights from next door houses where I live. There aren't no street lamps at all. No house close enough to see from my from our windows. My eyes are open anyway. I stare up into the darkness of of the living room, and the darkness stares back. I am remembering how was several years ago when Ma bought milk chocolate, rabbits, one Easter for me and Darlene. I had finished eating. I had finished eating one. But Darlene took only a nibble of hers every day. So, keeping it on, keeping it up on her dresser in its pink and yellow tin foil, driving me nuts. And one day, I just crept in there and ate off one of the rabbit's ear. Darlene, of course, threw at threw a fit. And when Ma asked me. If I'd done it, I said no. I could feel my cheeks and neck burning red. You sure, Marty? Marty? She asked. I'd only nodded and left the room. It was one of the worst days of my life. About an hour later, she come out. She come out on the porch, and porch where I was pushing myself slow in the swing, and sat down beside me. You know, Marty," she said. "Darlene don't know, doesn't know who ate the ear off her, off her candy rabbit, and I don't know who did it, but she just knows. And right this very minute, very minute, she just is looking down with the saddest eyes on the person who ate that chocolate. The Bible says that the worst thing that can ever possibly happen to us is to be separated forever from God's love. I hope you'll keep that in mind. I just swallowed and didn't say anything. But before I went to bed, when Ma asked me again about that rabbit, I gulped and said yes. And she made me get down on my knees and ask God's forgiveness, which wasn't so bad. I honestly felt better afterward. But then she said that she just wanted to, wanted me to go in the next room, and tell Darlene what I'd done. And Darlene had a fit all over again, threw a box of crayolars at me, and could have broke my nose. Called me a rotten, greedy pig. If that made you just sad, I never said. If that made you just sad, I never said. Now, as I study the darkness in the room around me, I'm thinking about lies again. I hadn't lied to Judd Travers when I said I hadn't seen his dog in the yard today. That was the honest to God truth, because Shiloh hadn't been anywhere near our yard. But I also know that you can lie not only by what you say, but what you don't say. Nothing I told Judd. Was an outli- outright lie, lie, but what I kept inside myself made him think that I hadn't seen him. Se- I hadn't seen his dog all. I hadn't seen his dog at all. Jesus, I whisper finally, which you want me to do? Be one hundred percent honest, and carry that dog to carry the carry that back. Carried that carried that dog back to Judd so that one of our one of your creatures can be kicked and starved all over again, or keep him here and fatten him up to glorify your creation. The question seemed to answer itself, and I'm pretty proud of that prayer. Repeated to myself, so as to remember it. In case I need to use it again, if Jesus is anything like the story cards from Sunday school make him out to be, 
uh, he are not the kind of kind to want a thin little beagle to be hurt. The problem's more mixed up than that, though. I'm lying to my folks as well. I'm not eating the leftover meat loaf I've put away. Every bit of food saved this money, saved that. Could go to Darlene a new pair of sneakers, so Ma won't have to cut off and open the top of her old ones to give her toes more room. Every little bit of food wasted is money wasted. If we ever have the least little bit of money to spare, that doesn't have to go for the care of care of Grandma Preston. First thing we all want is a telephone, so we don't have to write down, write down to Doc Murphy's to use it. But the way I figure, if it's food from my own plate, I would have eaten myself. But don't. What's the harm in that? Next morning, when I get up to see Shiloh, I put the rope. On his collar and lead him to the other side of the hill again, out of sight of all but God. Then I let him go, and we race, and we race and tumble and laugh and roll, and stopping now and then just to lie in the clover, me on my back, shallow on his stomach. Both of us panting and nuzzling each other. Don't know if Charlotte's getting more human or I'm getting to be more dog. If Jesus ever comes back to Earth again, I'm thinking he will be, he will come as a dog because there isn't anything as humble or patient or loving or loyal as the dog I have in my arms right now. We eat our Sunday meal, but. By the late afternoon, storm clouds roll in, and the rain beats down on the tin roof our, of our house, streaming down the window glass, making a small pond in the side yard. I can't help staring out the window at the far hill. Will Shallow? Can he even? Leap the fence to try and go somewhere. It's more dry. Is he smart enough to go under that lean to to I'd made for him? Have I built right away from the wind? What if he gets the howling? Gets to howling. In twenty minutes, the rain stops. Though the sun comes out, the birds start to sing again. All those worms oozing up through the wet mud. Shallow stayed where he was, trusting me that where I put him was best. Being quiet, like he knows his life depends on it. Marty then says, going outside with a rag to wipe off his jeep. I saw Miss Mrs. Howard yesterday, and she said David was back from Tennessee. Wanting to know when you boys could get together, she said David would like to come up here sometime someday next week. I like David Howard fine, but I sure don't want him up there up here. David likes the hill, always wants to play there. He's not afraid of snakes the way Darlene is. David, in fact, likes to go to the very top of the top of that hill, and then go running. Lickety split, slip, split down it, racing to, racing to see who's first to the fence at the bottom. Likes to climb the trees up there too, and play lookout. Will, well, I'll go down to Davis tomorrow. I said I'd rather do that. Why not do both? Ma says, coming up to throw some mesh. To the hands, you've hardly seen any friends all summer, Marty. Marty, why don't you go down to Friendly one afternoon and ask David to come up here afternoon? Come up here another. There's nothing much to do up here. I say, not knowing how else to answer. It was the wrong answer. Both Ma and Dad were looking at me now. You said 
just the other day you had plenty to do here that tells me raining ring in out is rag at the pump lots for me to do but not not much for david howard i say a lie that's a flat out lie funny how one lie is leads to another and before you know it your whole life can be a lie i sit on the porch swing later not even bothering to push it and listen to the table being set inside what you figure is wrong with that boy hello that said that voice what you figure is wrong with the boy lou just being 11 i guess ma tells him 11's moody age was for me anyway you think that's all it is what pleases you one day you don't please you at all next what more do you think it is don't think he's got that dog on his mind still do you eleven's got got about everything on his mind my answers and then the evening news comes on and darlene and becky come out to the porch leaving the tv to daddy darlene's got the devil in her tonight a little bit bored with summer but not quite quite ready for school to start just for devilment she plunks herself down beside me in the swing and starts doing everything i do i sigh she sighs i rest my arms on my head she does the same gets becky doing it too both of them laughing to beat the band when i have my feel of this nonsense when i have my feel of this nonsense i decide to go up the hill and see how charlotte's doing but as i go down the por- go down of the porch that arlene gets up and makes as if to follow me i stop i'm looking to find me a snake stick i say as if to myself i'm looking to find me a snake stick stick Arlene says, I don't pay her no mind at all. Just start walking along the edge of the yard. Picking up a stick here, a stick there, Darlene tagging along behind. It's got to have the longest handle. And 